Good morning, St. Francis. It is so good to have you here in this space with us. I have to remind you about two different things that I've told you about before, but it, it, it's, it's come time to get them done. The first is about the classes that I'm going to be teaching starting this week. They are in John Shelby Spong, and it is talking about his propositions that he, that he made to make this world different and better, and how we're doing, how, what progress we're making on those things. Um, the classes will be held on Wednesday at, at, 10 at 10 in the morning, on Thursday at 3 in the afternoon, and on um, Thursday at 7 in the evening. The one on, th on, on Wednesday morning and on Thursday evening, those are on Zoom as we have been doing, but on Thursday afternoon at 3, we are going to do that live. We will be in Ravenscroft room and we'd love to have you there with us. Second of all, I have to remind you that your assignment is due. Um, the end of this month, on the 28th, we begin Advent. And in Advent, we are going to use the writings that you are making about what this last 18 months, 20 months almost now, it has meant for you. What, what, what has this pregnancy been like for you? What's, what, what are the pains? What are the difficulties? What are the good things about what th this has caused, this time of birthing has caused in you? Um, please get those to us so that we can use them during the Advent season. Cynthia is now, now going to sing a song for us, which is one of my favorites, one of my wife's favorite songs. It's called In This Very Room, and it talks about how we have sanctified a space for each other, have helped each other to have a space, and that goes for the people who come before us as well. They were the ones who allowed us to find in this space something holy, something meaningful, something that changed us and gave us the gifts we need. And so as we listen to the song, think of those folks who are your saints, for this is All Saints Day. In this very room, there's quite enough love for all of us. And in this very room, there's quite enough joy for all of us. And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to change away any gloom for spirit holy spirit is in this very room in this very room there's quite enough love for all the world and in this very room in this very room there's quite enough joy for all the world and there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away any Spirit, Holy Spirit, is in this very
I stand here in front of our angel wall, those people who have spoken or lived or acted in such a way that we remember them. Those are our saints. On this day that we celebrate All Saints Day and we look back and we give thanks for all of that grand thrust of history that gave us so much. Today we also remember our individual saints. We have three people in our congregation who passed away this last year and so we remember each one of them. They are each up here on this wall and so as I say their name and I place a rose here in the vase for them, I invite you to say a prayer of thanks for who they were. The first is Judy Garnett who's over on that end of the wall. We give thanks for you, Judy. Second of all is Jimmy Murphy, whose service we had yesterday. He's right behind my head here. We give thanks for you, Jimmy. Third, just to the, to the um, right of Jimmy is Marvis Shelby. And we give thanks for who she was and who she continues to be. We give thanks for you, Marvis. But we, each of us, have saints as well. Later on in the commentary, I'm going to talk about a couple of mine. So I'm going to place a rose for, for them. One is my grandfather, Milo. And the other is my friend, Francis. I have more roses to place here in our bouquet. And as I do, I invite all of you at home to remember yours and name your saints, to give thanks for who they are and who they continue to be in your life. nice when our bouquet feels so full that there doesn't seem to be space for even one more. And yet there always is space. Dear God, we give you thanks for these saints, for these who blessed us, who gave to us, who showed us so many things. And we ask you to help us be the saints for those who come after us. For this we pray.
Good morning. I'm Pam Simon. I'll be reading The Call to Awareness, Hidden Teachers by Anne Mortefy. It is not only in the relative world that it can be said, when the student is ready, the master will come. There are hidden teachers who walk with us. There are ancestors who wait to support us. Spirits whose work it is to help us. Call the support what you will, angels, guides, the higher self, the Holy Spirit. That which we need is with us at all times. We can sense the presence through our intuition. We have but to be still, listen, and hear.
This morning's Children's Hour will be The Secret of Giving Thanks by Douglas Wood and the beautiful pictures were drawn by Greg Shedd. The world is full of secrets, gentle, shy things that some people know and some don't. The best secrets are the ones that make us happy and the best thing about any secret is sharing it with someone else who wants to know. Perhaps you'd like to know a secret, one of the happiest ones of all. You'll surely find it for yourself one day. You'll discover it all on your own, maybe when you least expect it. You might discover the secret at dawn, a morning like all other mornings. The sun climbs over the edge of the earth and begins to fill the world with light and warmth. It touches your cheek with a golden ray and you say softly, simply, thanks. Thank you, son, for the gift of a new day, for all its choices and challenges, and for all the beauty that it brings. Or sometime, perhaps, you'll notice a flower, as if for the very first time, and thank it for all its bright brothers and sisters, for the grace of their blossoms and the sweetness of their breath, for coloring your path and reminding you how easy it can be to smile. Or... You might discover the secret when you find yourself under an old tree and grateful for the cool shade on a hot day. Stay a while beneath its limbs, remembering that there is good and gentle gifts from all trees all over the world. Forests to explore, leaves to sing in the breeze, and roots to hold the earth in place, and simple lessons in how to grow. One long day you may stop to rest upon a rock, a silent stone that's been waiting age upon age for someone to come along and just say, thank you. Thank you, all stones and rocks and pebbles and hills and mountains. Thanks for your silence and patience, for standing still and not changing in a world so full of noise and speed and change. You may find the secret when you hear a bird sing, and feel grateful for the gentle music of the skies, for flash of wing and brightness of feathers, for the good company of graceful creatures who dance upon the wind. And perhaps you'll remember to thank all creatures who swim or crawl or creep or burrow or climb or run, creatures with fur or feathers, horns or hooves or scales or shells. They remind us of the mystery and beauty of all life, and they save us from a great loneliness here on our small blue planet, sailing among the stars. And those stars themselves, tiny twinkling beams from far, far away, farther than you can even dream, that give us just enough light for dreaming or wishing upon. Don't forget to thank them and the soft shining moon the night sun that helps us to find our way in the dark. Beneath the moon, the earth's waters are spread with silver, lakes and rivers, ponds and puddles, and streams and oceans. It is the waters that make the magic of life possible, perhaps one day taking a cool drink or paddling a canoe or swimming or splashing in the sun, you will remember to say thanks. Thank you, waters, for sweet drinks, for cool swims, and reflecting sunsets, and for the gift of life itself. Maybe you'll first find the secret in your own home, sitting around a table with people you love, giving thanks for good food and the good earth that gave it, for the many hands that prepared it, and for the family to share it. Perhaps one day you'll feel the secret, when someone is holding your hand, or kissing away tears, or hugging you close, or reading you a story, or tucking you into bed at night and reminding you to say your prayers, 
or it might be in your bedtime prayer itself as you th say thanks for sun and moon and stars and rocks and trees and flowers and waters and birds and animals and all those who love you and the love you feel for them. For here is the secret, if you've not already guessed it. The heart that gives thanks is a happy one, for we cannot feel thankful and unhappy at the same time. The more we say thanks, the more we find to be thankful for. And the more we find to be thankful for, the happier we become. We don't give thanks because we're happy. We are happy because we give thanks. We are building a new way. We are building a new way. We are building a new way, feeling stronger every day. We are building a new way. We are TLS, thank you for that song, Building a New Way. What an appropriate song for right now as we're trying to figure out what the future will be, that not just the future of church, but the future of each one of us and especially the future of us as a whole. Um, what are we going to build and how will we get from here to there? It all depends on you as it has in the past depended on all those who came before us, those saints Part of the reason why we remember them is because of the gifts they gave to us. And this congregation is a gift. This congregation is a way that we have helped each other and will continue to help each other. And in this crucial moment of history, as we're trying to figure out the next steps, both within our congregation, but also in our denomination and in our world, those gifts may be even more important than ever. Our stewardship campaign this year is called A Future with Hope, a time where we look at this and say, there's something great going to come out of this. There's something amazing that's going to happen because of all this we're going through. Tomorrow we will be mailing out our stewardship um, uh, materials. You'll get a pledge card like this, but it will be asking you, what will you give time, money, effort, prayer? How will you be part of this effort to change things, to become something different, to help us to become what needs to be the church of St. Francis in this moment? People have given for more than 50 years here at St. Francis in wondrous and incredible ways that allowed us to do so much, but this, this moment calls for so much. Enter into this prayerfully. Enter into it in a space of touching the divine around you and within you and say, what is it that you can do? How is it that you can help to make this world something brand new, wondrously new? Thank you for the gifts that you have already given and the gifts you will give, for they are exactly what we need to find the dreams of what should be. Amen.
Good morning, St. Francis folks. This is Mary Clean, and I'm here to um, offer prayers on behalf of all of us and for all of us. And so, uh, as we take a moment of quietness to center ourselves, I invite you to breathe in and breathe out. Focus on the breath. Focus on the spirit that connects us together, that holds us in love and care and visualize all the St. Francis folks that you know who are in need of our prayers right now. You'll note from the newsletters and, and emails that there are prayer requests. Hold those folks in your thoughts. Hold them in love and light as we go into prayer. Let us pray. God, you have been with us through the ages. You have borne witness to the ways in which the story of us, of all that has come into being, has been woven together piece by piece, life by life. We recognize today that it is because of the saints who have gone before us that we are those who have struggled for justice, who have given so that others may live more freely, we would not be if not for them. In remembrance and gratitude, we name the saints who hungered for righteousness and whose sacrifices have contributed to a more just society. Because of those who have loved us, those who have nurtured us, embraced us, celebrated us, or supported us, we are because they were. In remembrance and gratitude, 
We name the saints who have shaped our lives and being. We also hold in remembrance the ones whose lives were taken by injustice, the ones who never knew their own belovedness, the ones who passed on our faith, the ones who gave us art, gave us song, gave us poetry. We are because they were. Like us, we know they were imperfect too. There is no life that is not messy and contradictory often betraying the very justice and love we seek to embody. And yet you, O oh God, promise that our labor to love is never made in vain. Help us to lean on the witness of those who have gone before us, drawing on the love, justice, community, and faith that weaves us together generation after generation past, present, and future. With gratitude and in remembrance, we pray. Amen. My name is Elizabeth Fimbres, and I'll be reading from Revelations 21, 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See? The home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Elizabeth, thank you for reading that scripture for us. It is the best part of the book of Revelation, and it's an amazing thing. But before I get to that, I want to go back to last week. And Jack, who did such a great job with our offering, talked about, um, as he spoke, and saw some of the things that he'd seen in the development of how the LGBT community has been treated in America. He talked about a fire in a, in a church that was uh, on the top level of a bar called the Upstairs Lounge. And it was the NIMCC, Metropolitan Community Church um, uh, space. And that reminded me that I knew that story. And I had a movie about that, if you can imagine. 
Um, it's called Upstairs Inferno, and so I went and watched it, and it's a tragic story of 32 people killed because somebody was angry and firebombed the place. It happened in June of 1973 in New Orleans. And as tragic as the moment was, even worse was the aftermath. There were four bodies. Three of them were never identified. Well, one just barely. Now, um, almost 50 years later, was identified. Those others were never claimed. And the larger community was even worse. In the midst of this tragedy, the mayor, the governor, the, the, the authorities around did not even acknowledge what had happened because it was that kind of church, that kind of space. And there was no one that opened their doors. Although the, the, the community asked all around saying, can we use your church to be able to, um, to have a memorial service? Can we come and be welcomed? And church after church after church said no. Until a particular bishop, his name was um, Bishop Finnis Alonzo Crutchfield. He was the United Methodist Bishop uh, in, in Louisiana at the time. He said, there's a small church not far away that you can use, and I will be there. I, I was amazingly proud as a United Methodist that it was our church that chose to do that. It was our denomination that chose to be that space of openness and care. Then I went into the larger story. The story that didn't quite tell in the, in, the, um, in the movie. But Bishop Crutchfield, Bishop, Bishop Crutchfield was probably gay, but could never admit it as a bishop of the church. Was closeted and determined to stay in that closet, although he did in this moment care in the midst of the age crisis, he reached out and, and did things and called people to things. But in 1984, just three years before he died of AIDS, Bishop Crutchfield, at the General Conference of the United Methodist Church, gave a speech that supported the church opposition to the LGBT movement, that supported keeping that language of isolation and division in our, in our Constitution. Isn't it interesting that this is our United Methodist history, a history that goes back now 250 years here in the United States and over 50 years since that fire, that we are still in a space where we are divided. We're, we're still in a space where a closeted gay man makes it even harder for someone else to come out of the closet. No wonder our denomination is at odds with itself. There are things I would change about our world. This is one of them. How about you? If you were all powerful, what would you change? What stands as roadblocks to human development as you see them? What makes it so that the betterment of the world is hidden and is not being achieved. One of the great sadnesses for me in the religious community is that many Christians believe that the world has to go to hell in a handbasket before Jesus will come back to save us that Jesus will come back to make it all better. So, so they actively work for de-evolution and for chaos because that's bringing, up the, bringing back the reappearance of the divine for them. But what does that type of practice, that type of belief say about the divine? God chooses not to be present for humanity and for the world in order to prove the mighty power of God. I'll let everything go wrong so that I can come and fix it. 
That's not a God I want anything to do with. For it's putting all the worst of human traits onto the divine. The selfishness, the self-centeredness, the do it because I said and because I am. That's why our, Christ, our, our scriptural promise for this week is so important. It comes from the last book and almost the, the last part of that book, Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth passed away and the sea was no more. When you hear that, those last four words, the sea was no more, I want you to be clear about this. It is not talking about the Atlantic or the Pacific or the Caribbean. It's talking about the blue sea overhead, which in the ancient world separated heaven and earth and kept them apart. And what the writer of Revelation is saying is that that which separates us, which separates humanity from divinity, goes away. That in the world that he envisions, and I have to tell you that it's not a future world, but a present here and now world that he is envisioning. It is one where that separation is gone and those two come together. And he talks about that and says, and God came down and lived with humanity. And they come into a new relationship, a close relationship. See, the home of God is among mortals. It's not a promise for some distant future. It is a promise for right now, for what could be, what ought to be. This is God's vision for what ought to be in our world. It is God with us. And I have to tell you that we don't get there by becoming worthy, which is often how we've structured things in church circles. We get there by becoming aware. Is there a division between God and humanity? No. But is there one in my perception of that, dis that, that, dif that, that distance? Often. The stories we tell ourselves the ways we talk about God and about each other often affect the way we live. I heard a story this week about a man named Joey Holtz, who's a 37-year-old in, in Florida, and he kept hearing people complaining about how there weren't enough workers, that people weren't out there, and they were blaming it on the stimulus checks. But Joey knew that those stimulus checks had run out long ago. And so if people were staying home because of that money, then they weren't um, living in reality. And so he decided to do an experiment, and this was in September of this year. And so on the first day of September, he sent out two ap job applications, and he chose specifically some of the places where he saw the biggest complaints about how workers were not available and how they, they couldn't find anyone to take their positions. And then he did the same thing on the 2nd of September. And on the third, and he did it throughout the month, he sent out a total of 60 applications to all of these places that seemed to say they didn't have enough workers. By the end of the month, he'd gotten a bit of response. Nine email responses. One follow-up phone call and one interview. These places that needed workers so bad didn't even follow up when someone said they would work. That's because they were telling a story, not believing um, what was truly there. They were making up a fable about life, as we often do, instead of opening themselves up to what was true. They weren't aware they were only living their lie. At the end of all this about God coming down and the, the heavens and the earth be coming together, the man on the throne says this, 
I will make all things new. That includes things like this where we tell the stories, usually fear-laden stories. We tell those for our own purposes or because we don't know any better instead of thinking about what it really means. Carl Jung said this, if our religion is based on salvation, our chief emotions will be fear and trembling. If our religion is based on wonder, our chief emotion will be gratitude. Jung knew that, that um, how we view things, optimistically or pessimistically, makes a difference. We do a lot of scaring people into heaven, from my experience. And maybe that's why people stopped listening to church. Maybe that's why people have found other places of meaning. Look at this cartoon by the naked pastor. I don't condemn you, says Jesus, but the church has a different story. Not so fast, it says. And church has often been one of condemnation and a, a, a breeding of fear. Because fear controls easily. But this scripture says, I will make all things new. We have such power to control lives, but in the same way, we have the opportunity to do the opposite. And we have so many examples of how to do that, of how to draw ourselves into better relationship with each other. And most of those come from our heroes. And by heroes, I mean something like this. I love this, uh, this uh, meme of our just past president, Barack Obama standing in front of one of his heroes, Martin Luther King. They shine in the midst of the darkness where we find ourselves, in the midst of where it is that we don't understand. They shine as something different, better. I saw a webpage this week that talked about this, and it said, we talk about them, our saints, not because we're stuck or because we haven't moved on, but we talk about them because we are theirs, and they are ours, and no passage of time will ever change that. This day, this day called All Saints Day, this day when we remember those who have been so important to us, we talk about them because of who they continue to be for us. Not, not just what they did at some point while they were alive, but how they continue to be alive for us and continue to teach us. And we remember how they gave us essential pieces of our voice, essential pieces of our action in the world. And Mortify understood that when, he, when, when she talked about how when the student is ready, the master will come. And all of these teachers came and spoke to us, these hidden teachers who walked with us through whatever time it was where we needed instructing. The ancestors who continue to support us, the, the spirit, the spirits, I should say, whose work is to continue to help us, she talks about. And I'm so thankful for the ones that have been some of my saints. So I want to talk about a couple of them with you. One, his name Milo Charles Wiltbank. He was my grandfather. Here's a picture of him when he was young. Here's another picture of him. This is about the age he was that I remember him. He was really old at this time. I think he was 62. That's a little too close to, to me. He was a poet, but he was a cowboy. Cowboy was his occupation, while poet was his vocation. And in the midst of that hard work that he did, he also did that imaginative work. And he was a storyteller. And part of why I tell stories and love stories to this day is because of who he was and what he placed inside of me. And he um, wrote a poem that I'd like to share with you today. And the poem that he wrote was, was a very typical type of poem that he wrote. He often wrote at people's funerals. He often wrote to talk about the person or about the moment. And this one's called Out Beyond. Now he rests 
His care is forgotten, for he's made that last long ride up over the last big mountain, over the great divide. His saddle now is empty. His rope is put away. Just as if, it, just as if he'd finished Brandon, gone home at the close of day. Me thinks he's not dead at all, but camped beyond the hill in a better far off land with friends. He's riding still. My grandfather reminded me and continues to remind me that those who loved us, those who were important to us, continue to live with us, continue to be part of us. There's another saint I'd like to tell you about. Two weeks, um, two, two weeks ago, I got to go to a place in Yuma as we were visiting our godchildren there called Lutz Casino. It's named after um, who I think of as Daddy Lutz. He was big in the, the Yuma community back in the 40s and 50s, and he had two sons, Bobby and Billy. And Bobby came to me one day while I was there. Ten years ago, he came to me, and he, and he um, asked me to begin doing something. He runs this little um, wedding chapel. It's called the Gretna Green Wedding Chapel, and it sits just three um, blocks away from the church where I was serving. And when I say he runs it, that's really not right. His wife really does. And her name is Frances. And Bobby asked me to help Frances out and be an on call person to do weddings for her. And so I said yes because it was very convenient and I could connect into the community. And 10 years ago this week, we had an interesting day together. It was um, the 11th of November of 2011. Let me say that in a different way. It was 11, 11, 11. And on that day, Francis and I did 11 weddings. And so I was over at this little chapel here all day long with one couple after another coming through. And I'd spend just a few moments with each of them. And yet I realized that it wasn't just a few moments. It was important time together. And Francis taught me that being present in a space where you can give a blessing to this major decision, this time of change in a person's life, is essential. Eleven weddings, I, I don't know how many of those continue to be flourishing, how many of them are struggling, how many have ended, I don't know. I do know that for a few moments I got to be part of their lives as Francis for a few years, years when we did 300, um, 300 weddings, no, excuse me, 600 weddings together. She blessed my life. She continues to be a voice in my life. And Mordefi goes on to say, call this support like my grandfather's, like Francis, Call this what you will, angels, guides, higher self, Holy Spirit. That which we need is with us at all times. We can sense the presence. They spoke to me with presence of something larger than just themselves. They drew me towards something more. I'm so thankful that I was given those gifts. But you have those same types of gifts. You have people who have blessed you and been part of your life in remarkable ways. And this moment calls us to, in the words of Coco, remember them. Remember me, though I have to say goodbye. Remember me. Don't let it make you cry. For even if I'm far away, I hold you in my heart. I sing a secret song to you. Each night we are apart. Know that I am with you the only way that I can be. Until you're in the, my arms again, remember me. And there's a line in this song, which is sung in Spanish, so maybe you haven't quite realized it, but it's amazing. It says, may our song not finish playing. 
Because only with love can I still exist. Because of the love they gave us and because of the love we continue to use to remember them, these people who meant so much to us, these storytellers like my grandfather, these loving friends like Francis, continue to be a presence in this world, continue to help this world change through us. And it's when we remember with gratitude that it makes a difference. Brother David Stendhal Rost says, the root of joy is gratefulness. It is not joy that makes us grateful, it is gratitude that makes us joyful. Who spoke words of possibilities? Who continues to speak words of possibility to you? Who makes you grateful? Who brings you joy? Each rose on this table represents a dear one. Each rose on this table tells us of someone who touched our lives. Each picture on the wall behind me does the same thing. And they call us to that same effort. One of the pictures on our wall is Dolly Parton. You can see her right up in there. And she said this, if you see someone without a smile, give them yours. And it really is that simple be you in each moment with each person. Do something in that moment so that that person has a chance to be able to see God through you. So that you can be a channel of that larger presence somehow in that moment. Just as all your saints were themselves in their moments, and that meant they were not perfect. Each one, in fact, was uniquely flawed. But somehow, either in spite of those flaws or, or maybe better said, because of those flaws, they gave you some unique gift that helped you to be who you are today, that allowed you to see, if only for the moment, God dwelling here among us and making all things wonderfully new. And for that gift, we are grateful. Amen. One of the names often given to this meal, a name that we don't use so much at St. Francis, is the word Eucharist. And Eucharist literally means gratitude or thanksgiving. And part of why this is always a thanksgiving meal for me is because this is a time where I sit down with all the saints, both the ones who live here still among me, like you, like those that sit in the chairs here on Sunday, but also with all the ones who have sat in these chairs, with all those who walked with me through all those times of my life, all those saints were all part of this gift. Here, is the gift of love given to you. Here is the gift of community which calls you in. Come and eat, come and drink, and be thankful. Amen.
TLS, thank you for reminding us of the beautiful city that we are called to help build. And there have been so many before us who have put up this wall or placed a roof or made a flower pot to help make the beautiful city. And now it is our turn to join in to help make that city. For it is not a place that should crumble and go away so that Jesus can come back. It is a place where we are saying, Jesus, God, the divine is present already here. And we are living in that presence. And so with your saints, with those holy ones who have taught you and led you and showed you the way, may you enjoy the presence of God among us. And may you become one of those saints and join in the chorus. Amen. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in And when the sun begins to shine And when the sun begins to shine Oh, I want to be in that number When the saints go marching in Oh, when the trumpet be sounds a call trumpet sounds a call. Oh, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in.